the president might be trying to force people to bring those jobs back to the United States, but some workers here in the United States have other ideas. Many Americans are heading to Asia to find new opportunities. Why? Well, according to my next guest, it's because Asia is, quote, sexy. With crazy rich Asians owning the summer box office and K-pop topping the charts, don't ask me who that is, the world is taking notice. And don't forget, of course, ramen noodles. Brad Carno is the author of The Future of Is Asian Commerce, Conflict and Culture in the 21st Century. He's also the founder and managing partner of strategic advisory firm Future Map. He says lower taxes, good weather and lower crime are luring people there. Not to mention the fact that there's no Donald Trump or Brexit to contend with. Great to have you on the show. Great to be with you. Thanks. Okay, I mean, this book is fascinating, but you also wrote an op-ed for CNN.com, which yeah. I'll tweet out later too, which was great. But let's start with defining right. Asia. When we talk about yeah. workers going to Asia, what do we mean? Well, first of all, China is the center of the Asian economy. But remember, it follows on the wave, the leadership of Japan in its post-war years, followed by the tiger economies, then China. And now, China, Japan, and Korea are investing in the next wave of growth economies. So you see a lot of expats going to India. You see them all over Southeast Asia. I moved to Singapore a couple of years ago. It used to be, you know, a sort of placid, calm city. And now you've got just tons of expats coming in from America, from Europe. Everyone wants to start their business there. Everyone wants to be an entrepreneur. These countries are issuing entrepreneur visas. If you can't afford to live in Singapore or Hong Kong, people are going to Bangkok. They're going to Ho Chi Minh City. There's so many dynamic business centers in Asia today. I mean, we tend to talk about China when we talk about Asia right. and there's a, there's a risk of being a little bit myopic about right. that in a way but you're talking yeah. about a whole area that's five billion yes. people as opposed to one and a half billion exactly. that's in China yeah and we are going to wake up to this sooner or later if you look at just the last couple of weeks of uh, earnings reports you've got the slow revenue growth of Apple of Nvidia Qualcomm Caterpillar in China but they've all realized they need to spread their eggs out of just the China basket alone there are 2.5 billion people living between just South and Southeast Asia. Yes. Their ages are younger. They're receiving more foreign investment now. They have more open political economies. These are the places where you want to grow. Sure, it's not one single market called China, but it is absolutely the growth wave of the future. India is growing faster than China, as are other countries now in the region. I mean, I've got a great quote, and you talk about this, the trade between China and India. Let's talk more about India here as well, when right. we want to talk about the opportunities yeah. as and well. And let's again use the Apple example, because in the same week that Apple, just a few weeks ago, Tim Cook gave that disappointing news about slowing revenue growth in China, he also also announced on the back of that they're going to do more final assembly of the latest iPhone models in India. Yes. This had been a tug of war really between the Indian government and Apple for a number of years and Apple realized it has to cave in to some degree if you want to sell into those other markets of Asia. And that has a big impact on their bottom line here on their market cap. They've got to spread their eggs outside of just China. Yeah. I know a lot of people now that are learning Mandarin yes. in this country too because they see China as an opportunity even if they're not going to move there. Yeah. In order to do trade, you have to yeah. speak the language and right. understand the culture a bit and better. For those of us who didn't learn it in school, it seems so Herculean. But we are talking right now about teenagers and 20-somethings. Yeah. They've actually been learning Mandarin already. And we have to see the world from their point of view. They've grown up in a world, a post-financial crisis world, for better or worse, in which they realize that we're not necessarily the unshakable center of the world economy. And it makes perfect sense for yeah. them to actually start their careers in Asia. And by the way, Western business schools and universities, college campuses are flourishing in Asia. So I meet Americans and Brits who have done their entire undergraduate education in Asia at Western campuses. So they're getting a world-class education, but they're learning their Chinese on the side and other languages, networking and growing their entrepreneurial networks in Asia. Okay, so the big story right now, we've talked about it today, is the trade clash going on yes. right now between the United States and China. And the, we've got a cultural a challenge, I think, in understanding the two sides, but there also are asymmetries to address. You also had a great quote, and, and it goes into great detail in the book as well, about the fact that we, we look at China in one of two ways, and actually right. both of those are wrong, in right. a sense. Um, if we can pull the quote up, because it's important, I think that would be good. How do you think this ends? So Asia has been Asianizing. You know, the purpose of the book is to say not the, the, the present feels Chinese, but the future is Asian, meaning it's broader than just China. But part of the reason is because we think about China as this 
island floating above the world, you know, and the world is a flat place and it can just go and conquer. You know, the truth is, Asia, China is deeply integrated in Asia. China's largest trading partners collectively are its Asian neighbors. If you add up just China's trade with Japan, South Korea, India, and ASEAN, it's larger than their trade with us. So we, looking at it from the outside, have massively underestimated the extent to which China and its neighbors can actually substitute for us. Yeah. So when we import Im impose export controls on sensitive technologies, they'll just get them from Japan and Korea, and that will be bad for our business. What is capitalism, Asian <laughs> style? Because this is another whole section of the book. Right. Well, well, first of all, Asians are very comfortable with state capitalism, mixed capitalism. The idea that the government does play a significant role in picking winning sectors and in subsidizing industries and in having national champions. And of course, these things that China has been doing to force technology transfer and joint ventures and so forth. Remember, even the non, even the democratic countries of Asia do it. M India has a Make in India campaign. So yeah. Asians are comfortable with this mixed capitalism that's part of capitalism Asian style. You're going to have the tight relationships between the industrial leaders and the politicians. Jack Ma. Who are Jack Ma and others. Again, in India, it's been the case for decades too. Who writes the laws? Who writes the regulations? We have to get used to that, which is all the more reason why we can't just sit back and say, we'll just wait for them to change. They're not going to change. We have to go inside those countries, go local, and work on the business from the inside out. Is exactly. To go back to what we were showing you earlier, guys, the Mondelez CEO's point, you have to go local and yes. build up from there. Yeah. It was great to have you on the show. I'm going to tweet out your article and we'll talk <laughs> more about this as well. The wages are lower there, too. There is that. Uh, sorry, no, the tax rates are lower. Tax, not wages, wages. <laughs> cost of living. Yeah. yeah. Fantastic to have you on. Craig Palmer speaking there now.